Hello, my name is Chris Campbell, and we welcome you to another installment of One on One, where today our special guest is State Representative Kyra Bolden. Welcome to the show, Kyra. Thank you so much for having me. Well, let's get right into it. Uh, this year, as was the case with last year, has been unlike any other. Uh, what's been your biggest challenge thus far when it comes to um, addressing challenges, working with the community, and, and overcoming things related to COVID? Yeah, so obviously our biggest challenge um, in my uh, first term was the COVID-19 pandemic that hit us, um, that hit our community particularly hard um, here in, in Southfield and uh, Lathra Village. And so it has just been a whirlwind trying to get resources to folks, um, just food delivery, uh, making sure that folks have masks, um, and just overall resources. Um, we have a large senior population here. And so you don't really realize that a lot of individuals are isolated. And so what something that we did through my office was just senior care calls. Um, and so we just uh, pulled a list of, of numbers from our seniors and we partnered with um, the senior services uh, division of Southfield to just call people and just ask, do you need anything? Um, and then secondarily, um, do you just want someone to talk to? Um, and so those uh, definitely in my first term um, and continuing into my second term, COVID-19 has definitely uh, taken uh, the cake as far as challenges, but we're working through it. I'm really proud of how this community has come together to wrap their arms around one another and making sure that people have the resources that they need. And one thing that you can look forward to uh, this summer is uh, myself and uh, my staff members will be going door to door giving out resource guides uh, because we know that people are still facing challenges and we want to know, we want you to know uh, where to get uh, your resources, whether that be mental health or whether that be a food delivery or transportation services. And so I'm really proud of the way that this community has wrapped uh, their arms around each other to help each other during this really difficult time. Now, in terms of uh, the community and the vaccinations, the vaccinations are beginning to make their rounds and their way into the community. Uh, but uh, the media and the CDC has uh, cautioned about resting on our laurels. How is it that we can stay vigilant uh, during COVID-19? We can stay vigilant during COVID-19 um, by one, you know, scheduling yourself for a vaccine if you haven't already. Um, there are many places uh, that you can get a vaccine, including, you know, CVS or Walgreens. We have Ford Field that's doing mass vaccinations. There is a site um, right here on the uh, city of Southfield's downtown campus. And so I really encourage you um, to get your vaccine. Secondarily, even if you are vaccinated, that does not mean you cannot contract the disease and it doesn't mean that you can't pass it. So making sure you're still wearing your mask, mask up Michigan, and making sure you're still social distancing and also limiting your risk um, by making sure you're not um, attending large gatherings where uh, folks may still be asymptomatic and can pass it to you and you could pass it to your family members, even though you may you yourself may not experience um, a hospitalization or anything like that. Um, we want to make sure that we're still taking care of our neighbors. And that's the best thing that we can do while we're still going through this global pandemic. Excellent. Now, let's talk a little bit about your public service. So what made you become involved uh, as a public servant? Well, honestly, I became involved um, in public service just simply as a resident of Southfield. So I was born and raised in Southfield um, since I can remember walking. My mom would take me to the annual Martin Luther King Jr. March. And so public service was always ingrained in me growing up. And thanks, mom, for that. Um, but I really just understood the importance of government and understood the importance of having good people in government. And so I volunteered on multiple campaigns, whether that be for judge or for city council um, and some on statewide elections, because I it was really important to me that good people were elected. And so um, when things occurred um, in our community, it was just incumbent upon me to step up and be the change that I wish to see. And that is why I decided to initially run for office, just because 
I love this community so much and I thought that um, I would do a, a good job in taking care of this community that I was that I grew up in and that I love so much. Now let's talk a little bit about recent national events involving police brutality and systemic racism. Uh, that's been all in the news. And as an African-American leader, unpack your feelings at recent incidents of racial injustice and how that informs how you lead in the community. So the recent incidents or situations or issues of racial injustice um, are obviously nothing new, um, but now we have uh, cameras and phones that are accessible to us. And now we're seeing uh, murders take place, uh, you know, before our very eyes. And it's deeply, deeply hurtful um, and troubling. And as an elected official, uh, my first inkling is to say, what can we do to prevent someone else's suffering? Um, that is my first thought whenever something like this occurs. And I'm, I am an attorney and I am on the Judiciary Committee. And so one of our focuses um, in our Judiciary Committee and one of my focuses in uh, the legislature has just been decriminalization and reforming our criminal justice system to make sure that there are, le there are less people interacting uh, with the police and that when we do, um, those aren't seen as egregious crimes. Like uh, one of my bills just passed the House floor this week, and it simply turns uh, one of an, an, a misdemeanor into a civil infraction. So if you're driving a moped and a police officer asks for your registration uh, that and you don't ha and you cannot produce it, that's a misdemeanor currently, and my bill would change into a civil infraction. So things like that keep people out of the criminal justice system in the first place um, that can have lifelong implications. But also we're hoping to limit folks' interactions with the police in general um, by changing the crime class of, of, different, um, of different offenses. And so I think it's, it's twofold. It's accountability for police officers, um, making sure that crimes or um, civil infractions are properly characterized um, and making sure that uh, folks aren't in our criminal justice system for too long um, if it's not warranted so that they can be productive members of society. Excellent. Now your ties to Southfield are, are deep and, and well connected. You're born and raised here in the city. You're a product of Southfield Public Schools. What was it like growing up in Southfield and how does your background relate to how you engage with your constituency? Well, growing up in Southfield and attending Southfield Public Schools, um, I just want to say I received a world class education and um, that's why I decided to, after law school and after starting my career as an attorney, my husband and I, who also went to Southfield Public Schools, decided to purchase a home in Southfield because there's no other place that we can imagine living in. And so it is really my dream and my goal to make sure that this district um, that I grew up in is the best that it can be and is a great place to live, work, and raise a family. Um, it has really informed uh, me as a legislator, just being from a, a majority minority community, um, because I want to make sure that issues affecting minorities and black folks in particular are being heard on the state level. Um, I want to make sure that we are sharing in the allocation of resources on the state level. And so everything um, Everything that I've been around um, and how I grew up here has informed my thought process when I'm making legislation. Um, and that's why criminal justice reform is, is so important to me. Healthcare, um, our education system, um, really everything that I am um, has been a product of being raised in this community. And I love being able to lift up that voice every day when I'm in the Capitol for our benefit. Yes. Now, in terms of uh, your leadership roles, you serve as House Democratic Assistant Leader, Vice Chair of the Progressive Women's Caucus, and Co-Chair of the newly formed Attorneys Caucus. If you could, just briefly describe and walk us through what those roles involve. So I serve as the House Democratic Assistant Leader, which I did last term, and I'm continuing uh, my leadership role this term. 
And so um, my job is to help assist our caucus leader, which is the uh, highest elected position in the Democratic caucus. Uh, so that may require me to lead an initiative. Uh, so right now I'm leading our diversity, equity and inclusion initiative within our caucus um, to make sure that when we're proposing legislation, that we're looking through the lens of diversity, equity and inclusion and how it will affect everybody in the state of Michigan um, and not just certain individuals um, in particular. So that's one of the initi initiatives I'm leading as assistant democratic leader. Um, as far as the Progressive Women's Caucus, um, if you follow me on social media uh, at Kyra H. Volden, uh, you will know um, some of my own personal healthcare challenges. And so women's healthcare is really important to me and i'm glad that i get to expound upon that work uh, through my uh, role in the progressive women's caucus and then the attorney's caucus so the attorney's caucus is a bipartisan group of legislators and i really enjoy it um, we haven't been able to meet as much because of COVID, but the intent of the group is to just look at legislation through a nonpartisan lens just through the lens of an attorney to say, is this good legislation or are attorneys going to be arguing over this uh, once we pass it? And so just giving, you know, that second look to legislation uh, from a nonpartisan, just um, logical lens, I think will be helpful to folks, not only just here in the district, but in the state of Michigan as a whole. Yes. Now, in terms of uh, some of the committees that you serve on, you currently serve on four committees. Uh, the Ways and Means, Judiciary, the Select Committee on Reducing Car Insurance Rates, and the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules. Wow, you're checking off all the boxes there, Representative Bolden. Um, briefly, if you could, describe uh, the functions of those committees. Yeah, so those are my committees uh, from last term, and I got a, uh, a, a really bright introduction in my first term, being on all those committees. I had my hand in about everything. Um, so currently, I sit on uh, some of the same committees. So I sit on um, the uh, Minority Vice Chair of the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules. I'm on the Insurance Committee, and I'm on Judiciary uh, this term. So some of the same um, committees. Um, you know, there are robust committees. Um, insurance committee touches, you know, health care and car insurance and things that affect our daily lives. And I'm glad to have a voice uh, in those discussions. Uh, most recently, we voted um, out of committee um, oral chemo, um, oral chemo parity to IV chemotherapy, which I think will help a lot of folks um, in judiciary, you know, as I stated before, we're focusing a lot on criminal justice reform, uh, which I think is is excellent. And I have uh, gotten three bills passed into law uh, during my tenure uh, in the state house, and they've all been pertaining to criminal justice reform and victims' rights. And I'm very, very proud of that. Um, JCAR is a very <laughs> interesting committee. Uh, and so if you have any questions about that, I will be happy to explain. Um, but basically, there are administrative rules um, for our uh, different um, administra administrative organizations. So um, for LARA and for DHHS, they all have rules that we promulgate. Uh, or they have rules that they promulgate that we vote on. And so I'm happy to c continue to serve on those committees and I look forward to using them to help uh, Michiganders. Excellent. You know, you serve in a lot of different leadership capacities uh, over uh, a jurisdiction uh, that is quite large. What's your mantra when it comes to leadership? So my mantra regarding leadership is lift as you climb. And so very similar to our vice president, uh, Kamala Harris, when she said, you know, I may be the first, but I may not be the last. Um, I really believe in uh, once you get into a position of leadership or a power or um, a position to help others that you should use that to do so. Um, it only serves us to build up the next generation uh, to make sure uh, that um, we are doing the best that we can 
as far as quality of life for every Michigander and and honestly, everyone in the United States. And so um, my leadership style is very much built in mentorship and just trying to be helpful uh, to the next person. And let's talk a little bit about mentorship. You were mentored uh, by various uh, elected leaders here uh, to ascend to what you're doing now. How important is mentorship has it been to you? And then what advice would you have to young women of color who are aspiring to perhaps uh, take on mentorship roles like you have? Mentorship is invaluable. And I will say I would not be sitting here today without folks like Mayor Ken Cyber or Judge Sheila Johnson or Judge Deborah Nance, who uh, really took me under their wing and um, allowed me to be helpful to them, get a, you know, a bird's eye view into their lives and what they do, and really informed my decisions and career decisions um, as an individual. And so I really would recommend if you... Um, are looking for a mentor, simply reach out. You know, I have, I, I've lost count of how many mentees I've had, but I'm always excited to help people achieve their goals. And I think a lot of people are that way. Sometimes you need to uh, be able to reach out. Um, and so I would recommend uh, that you find a mentor um, and just shadow them and just ask questions and it will help you so much. And I will say that I've learned a lot from my mentees um, as well. Um, they inform me on how um, I should think about things and sometimes just on votes from a pers from their perspective. And so that relationship is mutually beneficial. And I really recommend that you reach out if there's someone that, that you admire, you think you'll learn from, um, and ask them to be your mentor. Now, before you became state representative, you were a civil litigation attorney at the Lewis and Monday PC firm in Detroit. Uh, briefly explain how that informs what you do as a lawmaker. So Lewis and Monday is um, one of the oldest and largest black owned law firms in the country. And they do um, a lot of work and they have for um, over 40 years. And being trained in that environment um, has been extremely, extremely helpful. Um, the partners in the firm mentored me, um, only wanted to be helpful to me. And I think that is really important. But just my experience just as a professional in the work that I did really helped me look at legislation uh, through the eyes of an attorney and to say where there might be problems, uh, with proposed legislation that I might be able to fix um, because I know as an attorney, these are some of the pitfalls that occur with legislation. So one thing that's really important to me is that legislation is very clear and that, um, and sorry to all the attorneys out there, but we, re we reduce um, the confusion and hopefully reduce the amount of litigation. So we don't want to argue over commas and things like that. And we want legislation to be as clear as possible. And I really received excellent training at Lewis and Monday that really helps me as a legislator today. Now, let's talk a little bit about work-life balance. In addition to your role as state representative and some of the other community service work that you do, you're also a wife. You have a family. How do you balance work and personal life? So balancing work and personal life um, is difficult at times. I am uh, very happy. I have a very supportive husband. Um, that understands the work that I do, that I, you know, I have to go to Lansing, um, you know, three days out of the week at least. Um, and it requires me to come home late sometimes. But you, uh, meal prepping is really important. Uh, so I try to use my days off to make sure um, that we're eating healthy meals and, you know, just making sure that no, no matter how late I get home, that I come home every night. Um, you know, that is really important uh, to me and to our family um, to make sure that I maintain a, a, a good balance. Um, but every waking moment, um, I feel like I dedicate a lot of time to making sure that the residents of the 35th district are taken care of. And honestly, I love it. I'm honored to do what I do to help folks in my community. And I just try to maintain that balance as best as possible.
Now, it's interesting that you brought up earlier our Vice President, Kamala Harris, uh, because you share a commonality with her. You are both part of the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, Inc. Yes. But you are also part of the National Congress of Black Women and the Women Lawyers Association of Michigan. Um, how empowering is it to you as a woman of color to be a part of and represent these historic black organizations and institutions? You know, again, I go back to my mantra, lift as we climb. And it is so important for me to be a part of these organizations that support and promote uh, black women because not only have they helped me, you know, just inform my decisions and mentored me, it allows me the opportunity to meet more uh, women and to help them along the way um, if I'm able to. Um, and I think that, um, you know, keeping issues concerning women at the forefront uh, when we're talking about legislation is, is it's also important um, because a lot of our legislation can um, focus um, on, on men. And so bringing that perspective and just maybe tweaking legislation is also important. So I'm happy to be a part of um, those organizations, um, especially Alpha Cap Alpha Sorority Incorporated with my uh, soror Kamala Harris and Vice President Kamala Harris. And um, I think having that network is so important to mentorship and making sure that we're building up uh, generations to come and to serve in leadership roles. Excellent. Now let's get into some of the legislative pieces. Um, let's talk about HB. 4132, and that is the criminal justice reform measure. And that's something that's been near and dear to your heart, but it helps save Michigan money and takes a compassionate approach to elderly, medically fragile, incarcerated individuals. Um, how did that all come together? And what was it like uh, getting some of your other fellow lawmakers on board uh, to get that measure passed? Yeah, so the me medically frail uh, bill package was a four bill bipartisan bill package of which I was a part. And what that does is allow for individuals who are deemed medically frail, so have dementia or maybe in a coma or um, maybe on dialysis to deem them medically frail and have them be eligible for parole. And if parole is um, granted, then they have the ability to go into a nursing home. And how does that um, help, you know, Michiganders? Um, we actually have medically frail units at our prisons that take care of these individuals that aren't eligible for parole. Um, we have full-time hospital staff. And there are, I, I had a chance to visit one at Jackson Prison, and there are literally people in comas that are not a danger to their, themselves or others, but simply cannot be released from prison because of how our laws uh, were. And so I'm happy that we can come together in a bipartisan manner to um, have a compassionate approach to folks that are not a danger to themselves or others. Um, and this legislation also takes into account victims' uh, opinions. And so it's not, it's not for everyone. It's very limited. Um, but I feel like this is a very compassionate approach that will also save uh, taxpayer dollars. And you know, fortunately, there has just been a great unity when it comes to um, criminal justice reform between Republicans and Democrats, and I'm happy to continue that work going forward. Excellent. Now let's discuss another one of your legislative successes, and that is House Bill 5117, and that's another criminal justice reform measure, but it amends the Wrongful Imprisonment Compensation Act and it expands access to justice and compensation for the wrongfully convicted. Uh, kind of walk us through uh, what your motivation was in promoting this measure and why it was so timely. The, wrongfully incarcer um, the Wrongful Imprisonment uh, Compensation Act um, had a, a glitch in it when it was enacted. And so um, we, we, t we cleaned up that technicality um, that would uh, basically allow for people to file within uh, 18 months, but the court of claims of which these claims went to, you had to file within six months. And so there had been cases that had been dismissed and or pending um, where people were not getting compensated for being wrongly convicted. 
And, you know, we put together a two bill bipartisan bill package uh, to address these concerns, because if you're wrongfully convicted, you deserve your compensation. And the technicality just um, created a situation where that wasn't possible for folks. So we cleaned that up. Um, and along with the uh, medically frail bill package, they were both passed into law signed by Governor Gretchen Whitmer. And so I'm happy again, um, that we can tackle these issues in a bipartisan manner and that they made it through the House and the Senate and that the governor saw fit to sign it into law. Um, it will help both bill packages or both laws now um, will help a lot of people in the state of Michigan. I'm very proud of it. Yes, as well you should be. Now, want to get personal and, and ask you a personal question in relation to Southfield. Uh, you've been born and raised here. You're a product of Southfield. You're native to Southfield. What exactly does Southfield mean to you? And what exactly are your long-term goals for the city? Now, we know your district expands to Lathrop Village and Bingham Farms and Franklin, but what about Southfield? Um, what are your personal feelings about uh, they being under your jurisdiction that you serve? So I hope to help Southfield uh, with further economic development. Um, I recently won an award for um, championing economic development uh, in, in the state level, and I was nominated uh, by our economic development director here uh, in Southfield. And it is my goal for Southfield to be uh, the best place to live, the best place to live, work, play, raise a family. Um, and so that means uh, that we need, you know, just more activities. Um, I want to help facilitate in that. Um, more restaurants, which everybody has been <laughs> uh, asking for. Um, I want people when they move here to not feel like they need to go anywhere else. That is my long term goal for Southfields. And, um, you know, I think we're going to get there. And Either way, you know, I love this community. I love the mix of rural and commercialness. Um, when I was knocking doors in the summertime, just to see the diversity of, um, of our community is just so beautiful. And maintaining that is really important to me as well. Uh, so economic development, but also just maintaining the character of Southfield um, are my long-term goals. Yes. Now, for uh, community residents and uh, community members and constituents that want to become more involved in state and local government, what advice would you have for them? So I would uh, definitely sign up for my e-newsletter, and I will also do a shout out for Senator Jeremy Moss. Please sign up for our newsletters. You can go to housedems.com slash bolden and put in your email. Um, you can also just email my office at Kyra or Kyra Bolden at house.mi.gov or give us a call um, if you have any uh, questions, comments, or concerns. Um, I do a joint coffee hour with Senator Jeremy Mo Moss monthly, and so we would love to have you if you want an, up an update on what's going on on the state level. And I also do a quarterly town hall um, that has various topics. And so I've done an education town hall. I've done a criminal justice town hall. Most recently, last month, I did a COVID-19 vaccine update. And we had the Lieutenant Governor, we had Congressman Brenda Lawrence, we had uh, doctors on there to talk about um, the vaccine. And I feel like it was really informative. And so the best way you can get involved is just to uh, stay informed with what we're doing and um, how we're trying to reach out. Um, you can also follow me on social media, Kyra H. Bolden, um, on all social media platforms. Um, I do my best to try to keep the community informed. And as much as you're informed, you can inform me on the things that, um, that impact and matter to you most. And so it would be my recommendation uh, to, to get involved, sign up for our e-news. And one other thing, um, I have advisory councils. I have a youth advisory council and an adult advisory council uh, where members of the community can just have private conversations and inform me about what's going on. Um, and it helps me keep my finger on the pulse of what this community needs. And so there are multiple ways to get involved. And I encourage you to do that. 
And uh, one other comment too, you're comparatively young in comparison to some of the other lawmakers. Um, uh, what words of wisdom and encouragement would you have to uh, those millennials who are perhaps seeking to have a voice in government and to have their voice heard and to have a seat at the table? What advice would you have for them being uh, a younger lawmaker yourself and a woman of color? My advice for anyone um, that wants to get involved in the community, whether that be an elected position or a volunteer position and you are young, uh, my advice would be to find a mentor. And um, But if you can't, don't let that deter you. Uh, but my first piece of advice is find someone that's done it um, because you may learn a lot about why things are the way that they are and it will help inform you on how to change things better um, it's hard to change things when you don't know why they were in the first place uh, and so it's important to learn from those that have come before us and then use that knowledge to shape um, how that you believe our community should function going forward so uh, find someone that's doing what you would like to do and pick their brain and uh, figure out the best course uh, going forward with that added knowledge. All right. Well, Representative Bolden, we thank you so much for coming down to our studios and having this conversation. And we look forward to hearing about some of the more amazing things that uh, are happening up in Lansing very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate your time. All right. Now you can view this episode of One on One by visiting our Facebook page and our YouTube pages by visiting Southfield Multimedia Services. In addition to viewing uh, this show on Southfield Cable Channel 15. For One on One, my name is Chris Campbell. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.